Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and just wandering out of camera range is Julie Oliver and she's a dog as well as a science fan. Now there's been a lot of media coverage of what's being referred to as a lockdown meta-analysis from John Hopkins University and in this video we'll be taking a closer look at the paper. Usually about now I say something along the lines of so let's go back to the science and have a look. This time I can't say that because the authors have admitted to removing most of the science papers and focusing on the economics and social science papers. But anyway, let's go back and have a look at the paper. So this is the paper, and you could be forgiven for thinking it is published in a peer-reviewed journal called Studies in Applied Economics from John Hopkins University. But that's not actually the case. This is an excerpt from the first page of the paper, and I will read it out for you because some people apparently can't bear to look at the screen because my face is just too unpleasant. So this is what it says. The Studies in Applied Economics series is under the general direction of Professor Stephen H. Hankey, founder and co-director of the John Hopkins Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the study of business enterprise. The views expressed in each working paper are those of the authors and not necessarily those of the institutions that the authors are affiliated with. So in other words, it's not a peer-reviewed study, it's a working paper, and it's not endorsed by John Hopkins University. It represents the views of the three authors, who incidentally have been vocal critics of lockdown since the start of the pandemic. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. This flowchart explains the process that they used to select the papers. They initially identified 18,590 potential papers through a database search of Google Scholar and Scopus. They then screened out any paper whose title didn't suggest it was related to lockdown and death. This left them with 1,048 studies, which were screened further down to 117, which were then assessed for eligibility. This then left them with 34 studies, which were included in the view, and 29 of these studies actually made it to the meta-analysis. Now, there's nothing unusual about excluding a large number of studies in a meta-analysis. It's quite common for studies to legitimately not be included. And if you're interested in knowing how this is done for meta-analyses involving medications, I've made a video about ivermectin meta-analyses, which explains, and I'll put a link in the video description in case you want to check it out. However, in this case, their exclusion criteria just happens to exclude the most robust studies in the field, as well as most studies authored by epidemiologists. Now, they really admit that they have excluded most studies by epidemiologists, and they justify it by stating that economists and social scientists are better equipped to do this sort of study. Now, of course, they would think that because they're economists. And of course, I wouldn't think that because I'm a scientist. But perhaps a better approach would have been to include both types to get a better overview. On a positive note, they did register a protocol for the study. And you can see it here. And it is the correct practice to do this. The protocol also contains a record of the changes that were made to the protocol over time, which you can see here. The first changes were on the 6th of July 2021 and were fairly innocuous. The second lot of changes were made on the 28th of October 2021 and introduced a lot of additional exclusion criteria for studies, which coincidentally knocked out a lot of robust epidemiological studies, which just happened to show that lockdowns work. As an example, studies comparing the death rate in Sweden with neighbouring countries were excluded because they said Sweden was only one country, so it wasn't acceptable to use as a control. Now, a suspicious person could think the delay in adding the extra exclusion criteria was because they did a preliminary analysis and didn't get the results they wanted, so needed to exclude more studies. But that's only what a suspicious person would think. Now, although they use the term lockdown in the paper's title, they use a rather broad definition of lockdown, which is as follows. The imposition of at least one compulsory non-pharmaceutical intervention, which they call NPI. NPIs are any government mandates that directly restrict people's possibilities, such as policies that limit movement and gatherings, mandate mask wearing, close schools and businesses, and ban international travel. 
So a lot broader than what a lot of people would consider to be a lockdown. The first analysis they did was to compare the level of stringency of lockdown measures with the mortality rate. And they did this based on what is known as the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. And this paper here was prepared by the group that actually introduced the index and provides the data. They did the original analysis and determined that increased stringency of lockdowns is associated with lower death rates. Strangely enough, this paper wasn't included in the meta-analysis. However, there were seven papers that were included in the meta-analysis. Well, sort of. So this is a table summarising the findings of the seven studies. And this is where the headline that lockdowns only reduce deaths by 0.2% comes from. Now, if you look at the table, you can see that different studies have been given different weightings. And one study has a weighting of 7,390. And the next highest study only has a weighting of 256. This translates to one study being responsible for nearly 92% of the meta-analysis. So although this is meant to be a meta-analysis of seven studies, the results primarily come from just one study. But believe it or not, it gets worse. So this is a study, and they definitely looked at the effect of the stringency measures. But here's the thing. They found that increased stringency measures were associated with reduced mortality, the exact opposite of what is being claimed in the meta-analysis. You can't make this stuff up. The authors of the working paper based most of their findings on one study, but then didn't actually use the results of the study. They did their own analysis and came up with a different result. The next thing they looked at was the effect of what they call shelter-in-place orders which are basically orders to stay home and not leave except for specific purposes. And they found that overall, these only reduced mortality by 2.8%. Again, we still have the issue of them excluding most of the relevant studies, but also they were actually looking at the effects of shelter-in-place orders on top of other restrictions like business closures. So obviously, if most of the places that you can go and mingle with people are already closed, you probably aren't going to get as much of an effect by forcing people to actually stay inside their homes. And in fact, this could be counterproductive if the restrictions are too harsh. For instance, if you're not allowed to leave home to go for a walk, but can leave home to buy groceries, a lot of people could go grocery shopping every day just to get some exercise and end up having more close contact with people than if they just went for a walk. On the other hand, if you allow people to meet up outside in parks, but not inside houses, then intuitively you would expect a benefit. Of course, they haven't looked at subtleties like this. They've just lumped everything together. They then looked at the effect of specific interventions. And here, even with their removal of most epidemiological studies, they still found that mask wearing and closing bars and restaurants, et cetera, did lower mortality. However, I was rather stunned to see that they are claiming that border closures and quarantine don't impact mortality rates because, of course, I live in Australia and we did close our borders and required anyone entering the country to do a 14 days mandatory hotel quarantine. And our per capita mortality rate is significantly lower than that of countries who didn't do the same. Now, the system wasn't perfect. There were still some breaches which resulted in the virus spreading and then lockdowns to get things back under control. But overall, we did pretty good. And by the way, our borders will be reopening on the 21st of February. So if you're double vaccinated, you can come and visit us in Australia. That's a little ad for Tourism Australia. Anyway, back to the working paper. I decided to take a closer look at the data on the claim that border closures had no effect on mortality. And it turned out that it was being skewed by one particular study, which is this study here. What they actually did in this study is they compared the timing of various interventions across states in America. But the whole study only looked at the first five weeks of the pandemic. And five weeks just isn't long enough to see effects of an intervention on death rates. So this study should never have been included in the meta-analysis. 
After falsely claiming that lockdowns have no effect on mortality, the authors then go on to talk about the negative effects of lockdowns, in particular the effect on unemployment and the economy overall. And of course, these are real effects and they need to be taken into consideration. But what the authors fail to consider is the effect on the economy of doing nothing, because as cases and deaths start to rise, people will choose not to go out to bars and restaurants anyway, and the economy and employment will still suffer. In contrast, if you can get things under control quickly with a lockdown before things get too bad, the economy will bounce back. And that's exactly what's happened in Australia. Our current unemployment rate is the lowest it's been since August 2008. So in summary, this is not a peer-reviewed study. It is a working paper and it ignores the majority of the published literature. So any claims being made based on the paper are not supported by the science. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that more people will see it. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.